this and okay thanks keely um so we'll be recording but i'll start the the intro and everything later after i I work through my spiel. Okay. Um, we basically help people um, navigate mold illness and hypersensitivity. And I'm not sure if that's something that you deal with. Are you, um, do you have MCS or, or mold sensitivity? I do not actually. Um, I came to this topic because I actually write about sustainable fashion and um, yeah. And I heard about um, airline attendants who were getting sick. And so I decided to investigate and that's how I got here. But I think that um, I think that um, actually my, the fact that I'm not suffering from this personally is actually might be a strength of the book because I mean, as you all know, people tend to gaslight people who are suffering from things themselves. Um, and so me coming in from an outsider's view and looking at all the evidence and saying like, yeah, there's something here, I think is really, could be really beneficial. Very interesting. Okay, Alton, I'm going to just uh, introduce ourselves, the okay. podcast, introduce you, and then we'll get going. Okay. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. I'm Alicia Swami. I'm here with my co host, Eric Johnson, Keely Severson. We are exposing mold. Today, we are here with Alden Wicker. She's an independent journalist specializing in sustainability. She's an author of the coming book, To Die For How Toxic Fashion Is Making Us Sick and how we can fight back. And that is expected to uh, be released on June 27th, correct? Yes, that's right. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited. Thank you for giving us a, a copy to kind of look over before this interview. We really do appreciate that. Um, one thing you said in chapter one, I was like, wow, that really knocked me for a loop. You said that it occurred to me that while beauty and cleaning products and packaged foods come with an ingredient list, fashion does not. So I'd love to just have a conversation about your book and the hidden effects of chemicals in our clothing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, first of all, I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, you know, and, uh, I think mold has a huge role to play in this. And I was sad that I couldn't cover it in the book, but, um, I think that, um, there's so many different things that are happening to our bodies. Um, and one of the people I talked to called them environmental insults. And I thought an insult was such a good way to talk about it. And, you know, people who are, who have allergies to certain things, who have eczema, who, um, whose bodies react to exposure to um, certain odors or chemicals, um, VOCs, all those things, um, they're really left out to dry when it comes to fashion choices. Because, you know, you you can go to the beauty store. Um, Mayo Clinic actually has an app that allows you to look at different beauty products and personal care products and see which ones might set off your eczema and which ones might be okay. And there's there's nothing equivalent for picking up textiles, even things like underwear or socks that are going to be worn on your body. It's sort of, you know, people have to go to the store and sort of pick up different clues and then try things that have a good return policy and then try them out and see how things go for a week. And then maybe if they don't react, they can continue to wear that piece of clothing, or they might just have to return it and try again. And I think it's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. And I think it's frankly disrespectful to people who um, know that they need these accommodations and this information in order to live a good life and they're not getting it. When were these issues first reported? Like when did we start seeing people complain about their clothing? Yeah, I think so. Um, in the book, I actually start with uh, Alaska Airlines because um, in 2011, um, well, there's there's two phases actually. So there's the modern story of when people started realizing this was a problem, which was with the airline attendants um, at Alaska Airlines getting very, very sick. Um, a good portion of them, I think it was up to 23, 25% at some point we're reporting reactions to their clothing. So everything from really terrible skin rashes to um, headaches, breathing problems. Some of them saw their hair fall out to the point where they were bald, um, all sorts of thyroid issues um, and uh, asthma, all of these different things. So that was the first point in our modern age where you know, people started saying like, hey, I think, I think 
fashion can have extremely detrimental effects on our health. And so there's sort of this mystery of what, why is this, why is this happening? What are the chemicals? How did they get there? All those things. But actually people have been reacting to clothing forever. Um, you know, in the, uh, starting in the 1500s, people were using mercury uh, to uh, make men's hats. Uh, there was also, there's arsenic used in um, different things as well for a green dye um, in the 1800s. And then we moved into the age of fossil fuel uh, dyes and chemistries. So that was in the mid 1800s to late 1800s. And people started having reactions to their fancy new brightly colored socks. Um, you know, people would get rashes in the shape of stripes from their um, coralline colored socks. And, um, you know, they were reporting these reactions. And um, again, it was the same thing that happens today, which is like, well, I'm not having a reaction. So it must be fine. I don't, I don't know. You must be, you must be overly sensitive or, or making this up or sensationalizing. Um, there were very few people back then that were advocating for, um, for natural clothing that didn't have these newfangled fossil fuel dyes. Um, some of them were taken off the market, the ones that were most obviously toxic, but uh, you know, there was never a ban or anything on, on using these toxic chemicals in fashion. So it's sort of voluntary piecemeal and um, not very well regulated even today. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up how, I mean, we're always wearing clothing. I mean, you don't see people ever walking in anywhere naked or without <laughs> clothing. Like we're all, we're always clothed 24 seven around the clock, except for maybe 20, 30 minutes when we take that shower, you know, once or yeah. twice a day. So it's like, we're always exposed to these different types of, of things in the clothing. Yeah. And it makes it really, really hard to pinpoint whether it's the clothing that is making you sick, right? I mean, you know, of course, some people have reactions right away, like they smell something and they, they're like, oh, this is, this isn't going to work, right? Like I talked to several people in my book who said, you know, they pick something up in the store, they smell it and they go, mm -mm, not for me. But a lot of times, you know, these reactions come along really slowly, they can show up a few days later, especially when you're talking about rashes. And so, you know, we wear so many different things over the course of the week that, you know, you'd almost have to go on a clothing elimination diet to figure out what is causing you to have these reactions. Um, some things, you know, they, they smell bad when you, when they get there. So that's a pretty good indication, but a lot of these really toxic chemicals are, are completely odorless, right? Like what is perfluorinated chemistry, that Teflon chemical, that forever chemical that's been in the news lately? What does that smell like? Doesn't smell like anything. Doesn't look like anything. So we need better labeling for these things so that we can, you know, protect ourselves and protect our families. Yeah. You described the experience of what a lot of us, um, people who are mold sensitive, like we <laughs> will react to clothing just based on how they feel not necessarily what they smell like. Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting phenomenon there. Um, that first gal that you introduced in the beginning of your book, you described her as wearing a white cotton t-shirt and like black shorts. And I'm like, that's the mold avoider outfit, <laughs> choice. you know, like I have my white cotton t-shirt on now. Um, yeah. And you know, something that um, Eric had brought up in the past um, about mold being mentioned in the Bible, Eric, uh, maybe you can speak more to this that we were thinking, because there's a lot of people that say, oh, well, a lot of this stuff was reported in ancient texts in the Bible and mold was in there and it was a problem. But he thinks it was actually, they were describing issues with their clothing because clothing was such a hot commodity and very hard to produced back in those days. Um, Eric, do you want to comment on that? Well, when people uh, compare their modern mold illness to events of the past, they uh, suspect that the description in Leviticus of having to tear down a house because of red and green mold growing on the plaster being so problematic that the people who did the remediation had to burn their clothing, stay outside until sundown. And it was um, really a, a good description of the severity of the fear that people have of clothing and of mold. But at the same time, they weren't describing 
what people are talking about today, crawling out of their house, a normal house that other people can tolerate, and never being able to go back in again. So even though there's similar things in the Bible, it's not exactly the same as what we're seeing right now. So there's something that kind of took off back in the 1980s that um, seems to go far beyond any previous historical descriptions. You know, it's interesting you say the 1980s because completely separately, I've been working on an investigation for um, an outlet called Vermont Digger. It's an investigative um, online newspaper, and it's about polyurethane spray foam. So polyurethane spray foam took off in the late 70s because of the oil energy crisis. And um, it's a plastic, it's a fossil fuel thing, um, product, and it's hydrophobic. And so um, if you put it into your walls, it's like wrapping your house in a plastic bag. And in an old, older house that's not insulated well, um, the heat will come out through your walls and it will dry out any moisture that is coming out through your walls, right? Like moisture from cooking, from showering. Um, maybe if you have a wet basement, all these different things. Once you wrap your house in this polyurethane spray foam, it's going to trap a lot of moisture. And that moisture is going to potentially accumulate and um, could cause a mold problem. And I actually interviewed a mold remediation expert um, in Vermont, and he said, yeah, this didn't, this didn't happen 50 years ago, but, you know, I've seen soffit vents, uh, you know, covered in spray foam so that the, the attic can't, you know, get that humid air out. Um, so that's one of the things that has changed is that we've put fossil fuels not only into our fashion, but into our homes in a way that we don't really fully understand the building science of what that does. I wound up having a reaction to that spray foam myself. And, yeah, um, probably because the isocyanate, that off gas out of it and the amines, which are both present in certain fashion products as well. Yeah, but every time they test the clothing, they insist that the levels, which uh, formaldehyde and these other things are incorporated, is too low to be a problem. Mm. Yeah, um, you know, that makes sense to me because um, I think, I forget which chapter it was, but it was the chapter where I was talking about uh, multiple chemical sensitivity or toxic, toxicant induced loss of tolerance as the researcher I interviewed calls it. And she pointed out that toxicologists when they're testing what levels are quote unquote safe for people to tolerate, um, usually, so either the testing is done over a long period of time at a factory where people are exposed to formaldehyde every single day at levels that are measured and recorded, and then it's seen whether or not they get cancer, right? Like what is, what is the risk of cancer? Um, or they're testing these things on animals, rats, and seeing when uh, they start having observable effects. So the problem with these two types of data is they're accurate, they're very accurate in some ways, right? But in other ways, they don't tell the whole story. One says, okay, as long as you don't get leukemia, you're in the clear, it's okay. The other says um, observable effects, but a mouse isn't gonna tell you whether they have brain fog or whether they're, you know, whether they're a little bit confused or whether they just feel like kind of tired or um, all of these different things that are sort of more that manifest sort of psychologically that you would need words to articulate to somebody. So this these two ways of testing for the sort of safe dose of various things, um, you know, they they don't tell the whole picture. I mean, you know, we want to thrive. We don't want to survive, right? These exposures. And then the final thing is that, you know, yeah, once you're you go through an event where you're hyper exposed to a toxin, your body becomes sensitized to it and reacts to that. And I think that, you know, it's it's a shame that as a society, we're not recognizing that because this is something that perhaps one in five people deal with in the United States. And we're not making accommodations for people so that they can really live their life and thrive, not just avoid cancer. That's a very low bar. I remember the controversy when um... Claudia Miller developed her toxicant-induced loss of tolerance theory and name in 1996. She 
because she uh, primarily based this, her initial research was into a casino cluster. A mm -hmm. bunch of uh, employees at a casino at South Lake Tahoe got sick from pesticide exposure. And the controversy was that the um, employees were getting sick, but the people applying the uh, insecticides, the cockroach sprays, they weren't sick. Mm -hmm. They say, we work with this stuff every day. Mm -hmm. So why are you getting sick and we're not? So the casino fought the employees as hard as they could. The employees were clearly sick, so they eventually were able to win the settlement. But the issue was never settled as to why the people with the highest exposure managed to evade getting tilt, whereas the casino employees uh, all acquired this in a group. Yeah, I mean, without, I haven't actually looked into that um, as much, but no. yeah, that's a really interesting incident. I mean, it it just, it reminds me of how the, um, the airlines and the uniform makers uh, told all of these airline attendants that, you know, okay, fine, you're sick. Tell us the chemical that is causing all of your symptoms. And if you can identify the chemical that's doing this, then perhaps we can talk. Well, that's impossible to do. I mean, there's so many chemicals in the uniforms and then there's chemicals on the planes and all of these different things. And so it's a, it's a way for them to avoid uh, being held accountable for this. Um, and a lot of the airlines, um, so the four different airlines, there was Alaska Airlines, American Airlines, Delta Airlines, and then Southwest is still ongoing. Um, so those three other airlines eventually swapped out their uniforms without admitting the uniforms were toxic. So they just sort of chalked it up to like, this is becoming a problem. It's a big distraction. Um, so we're going to go ahead and swap them out, but we still don't think that this is a problem. And they use that same language of, well, everything individually is under the levels that are considered safe. So uh, we don't think that there's any problem here. So I've been watching this same argument go on for many, many years, since 1985, really, when it became a huge deal. And it was the same argument over and over again. The levels at which you're exposed to the chemical that you're implicating is insufficient to cause any known illness. Yeah, I mean, on average, statistically, we all know that our bodies are very, very different. We have different histories. We come from different areas. We have different genetics. Um, I think, you know, that sort of, well, statistically, according to our testing on lab rats, this shouldn't happen. I mean, use your eye you know I mean I, I think we need to move beyond this sort of like statistical average population level assessment and take people who as they are and who they are on an individual level and provide them the care that they need you know I'd, I'd like to throw in a little plug for Dr. Gary Holmes the CDC epidemiologist who authored the 1988 chronic fatigue syndrome definition because people curse him for writing a, a vague syndrome, creating all this confusion, giving it a stupid name, which really wasn't his idea. But actually, Dr. Holmes was not a bad guy. And he said, let's single out these people, pick a dozen people who have this problem and study the crap out of it. I mean, just follow these people, everything they do, everything that you know about where they've been, what they've done until we can figure it out. Yeah. And it was actually a good idea. And I think if you did that to any cluster, like with these uniforms, if you stuck with these people, quit jumping from one chemical, one person to the next, and just hone in on what that person did, you might get an insight that would lead to things that would explain other cases of similar illness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is, it is too bad. I mean, we do have the Harvard study that you know, looked at uh, Alaska airline attendants before and after the introduction of uniforms and overall did see a rise in a number of different health symptoms, but it didn't do a follow-up. And you know, I hear from these attendants and they say, oh, they've discovered uh, you know, I have skin cancer. Or, oh, now I have this autoimmune disease. And so I wish there was a long-term follow-up for a lot of these airline attendants because, you know, that was just like a point in time and, and we're seeing a lot 
longer term manifestations of that of that poisoning. What's really interesting is your mention of uh, Rachel Carson um, in her book, Silent Spring. And so are you saying basically from her book that that like ignited sort of this environmental awareness because of the extinction of the bald bald eagles? Well, yeah, possibly. it did. Um, it really, uh, it really, it hit hard, I think, you know, I've been reading her biography actually recently, just to seat myself in sort of the context of the time and, um, and a lot of scientists were aware that DDT was a problem, but they needed someone like Rachel Carson to bring it all together and show like, this is what the world is going to look like if we don't stop doing this. Um, and that's where the title Silent Spring came from, right? Like no more birds, um, not even just bald eagles, but small birds and caterpillars and all of this, these thriving ecosystems, um, fish, all of these different things. So, um, and it wasn't just about DDT either. It was just it was sort of about this indiscriminate use of chemicals in every application without thinking about the knock-on effects or testing to make sure they're safe. And we've come so far since then, right? We have the EPA, the EPA makes different factories, say how much, you know, emissions of different chemicals are coming out of their stacks. Um, they're checking the water. Um, but we made this huge leap forward, uh, arguably because of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. And then we just stalled out. So we have the super fund um, program that took a lot of money, which is why it's called the super fund and like used it to clean up all of these toxic sites. But that work has slowed down and we're in dire need of an update um, for all of these different things um, to, to tackle the problems that we have today. Well, there's so many things going wrong that uh, the investigators say you can't focus on any one thing. It's just too much. It's like a toxic soup. You're getting hit with anything and everything. And while that seems reasonable and logical, because we certainly are bombarded by uh, innumerable uh, toxic substances, at the same time, if you approach it from the point of view that it must be toxic soup, that stands in the way of isolating any one particular thing for follow-up. Yeah, yeah. And I think it can feel completely overwhelming and disenfranchising to think of it in that way. Um, you know, I do, I wish I had been able to include a broader swath of society in the book reporting. But as I say in the book, I had to focus on people who largely had control over their environment, right? So people who are not living near toxic waste sites, people who, um, you know, aren't near um, one of these industrial farms, you know, people who are able to clear out their environment and then finally get to the point where they're like, okay, the last thing that is left is fashion and I'm going to address this. But, you know, as you say, like it can come from so many different areas. And, you know, I talked to a lot of people who they have multiple overlapping exposures to things that have made them sick. And fashion is just one part of a bunch of different things that are in their environment that they have to manage now. So you've got your carpets and you've got your industrial, you know, like truck stops nearby, like a lot of air pollution. Um, you know, a lot of people, one woman said her children um, started reacting cl to clothing and that led her to investigate what was going on. And she realized they had lead poisoning because they lived in an old farmhouse that they had renovated. So there's so many different things and fashion is one of them, but I think fashion is so undercovered in this way. And what I want to tell people is that, you know, if you're perfectly healthy, if I don't want to put throw another thing on your plate to, to be scared of, especially if you're a mom, right? There's so much that you're already working on. Um, and if you're perfectly fine, great. But if you are struggling with chemical exposure, um, with health, chronic health problems, don't discount fashion is one thing that you can address to improve your quality of life. If somebody okay got if sick I... uh, renovating an old farmhouse, what would lead them to uh, further or enhanced exposure to lead? 
Um, just sanding the old lead paint off of the floor and uh, all that dust getting into the house. You have to be very careful about that. Keely, you wanted to ask a question. Well, I wanted, I wanted to share something with you because I've had sensitivity to chemicals and I've had a lot of problems with my clothes. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to tell you about those two things, if that's okay. Please, yeah. Um, when I developed chemical sensitivity, I just suddenly was unable to use my perfumes that I had loved for so long. And my husband had like a special perfume that he got me every year and it was our thing and we both loved it. And suddenly I just couldn't wear that and I couldn't wear other perfumes and I couldn't be around people with perfumes. And then suddenly I couldn't use bleach in my apartment and I couldn't handle it if my husband used bleach, even if I was gone. And if he just used it and hours later I went in there and I'd breathe and it felt like I was like drinking bleach because it was like still so strong. And I thought I would never be able to use bleach again. But what we didn't know is that there was a water leak in the wall and Mm -hmm. mold growing under the floor. And it seemed like there was some combination between Do you know that the toxins that mold, that fungi produces, they're called mycotoxins, but they're actually chemicals? They're not fungi, they're chemicals. Volatile organic compounds, yeah. So I'm wondering, I believe, I suspect, I know that that exposure somehow sensitized me and made me sensitive to those other chemicals and I actually was able to reverse my sensitivity oh amazing so that I don't live with chemical sensitivities this is only something that I endure when I am mold exposed Mm -hmm. a complicating factor to my sensitivities is also being around mycotoxin contaminated items Mm -hmm. So what that means for me is I just recently had another exposure that I didn't know about. It snuck up on me. I was not aware that it was present or a problem for me. And during this exposure, I could not tolerate any of my clothing. Mm. Okay. I would, I'm, I only wear these. I've been in white t-shirts for probably a year and a half or two years. I don't know exactly how long, like Alicia stated, It's the mold avoider outfit because once you get so sensitive to life, that clothes start to bother you, it gets pretty tricky to navigate things. Yeah, yeah. I would buy packages of like six and 10 white Hanes t-shirts because they were essentially disposable. And so I would like filter through these packs and the reasons that they were disposable was because I would open them in my home and pull one out. And the second that I would pull it out, I would check it. I have like a way that I check to see if stuff bothers me and it would bother me right away. And I would say to myself, these are arriving contaminated out of the package. And I said that to everyone who would listen to me for probably six months. And that's not what was happening. What was happening was I had so much particulate pollution in my home from this exposure that the second I was opening this package, everything that was clinging to my house, clinging the environmental issues in my house were clinging to this t-shirt. And now that I was checking it, I'm reacting because of what has just absorbed in my house that I don't even know is here. And I'm pointing to the t-shirt like it's the problem. I have been in disposable clothing since July 23rd, meaning like it gets thrown away indefinitely of Mm -hmm. last summer. now that I have identified the exposure that was causing this problem and removed the bad window and upgraded the other windows in the house so that we're not currently in the same level of exposure, I can buy these packages of t-shirts from these exact same stores and open up and they're completely fine. Yeah. They're the same stores from the same locations the same clothes made out of the same stuff. The only difference is now that I'm not exposed, 
my clothing isn't bothering me. I don't have chemical sensitivities. And I just, when you hear something like allergic to clothing, for me, it's like, oh, that's a clue. That's a clue that there's something big environmentally going on. And I think that if it is mold, if it is mold, but we're saying like all chemicals are so dangerous, we're going to miss what mold is doing. And I think that it's possible to probably narrow it down to one chemical. Potentially. I mean, there's so much we we don't know. That's the thing is that you know, when I first started reporting this book, I, or actually I reported on an article a few years ago and I would contact experts in various things and they would say, ah, oh, you know, I don't really know anything about fashion. It was like fashion was this silly woman's issue and a serious scientist would never, you know, spend their time on something like that. Um, and so all of the research in the book is super new and it comes from the fact that just in the past few years, people have started paying attention to fashion, but there's so much more research we need to do. So I just want to say that from the outset, there's so much we don't know. Um, I do think that there's a possibility that what you're saying is true, right? Like that when you have these volatile organic compounds from mold floating around your house, they can get on um, anything that's around and, and, and cause you problems. It could also be that your body is fighting is, you know, your mast cells, which are something that um, Claudia S. Miller describes. I'm just going to go ahead and and interrupt here because we have a very specific theory on mast cell activation Mm -hmm. syndrome. And within the context of our work, if you have mold hypersensitivity, meaning you can have instant reactions from minute exposures, not dosage dependent, just however much you react to, Um, that can cause mast cell activation syndrome as a sign and symptom of the hypersensitivity. So that's like our organization, that's our stance on mast cell activation syndrome. And that that lines up with the research that's in the book. Um, So Miller's most recent research said that she, has a theory that she thinks she's proved out around what mast cell activation, the biomechanism behind mast cell activation syndrome and how it also relates to what she calls toxicant induced loss of tolerance, which I mean, I'm going to grossly oversimplify it, but it lines up with what you're saying, right? You're the mast cells, which are protecting your body from outside toxins have been hypersensitized to things to something and anything that looks like it as well. And I kind of describe it as if, as if you're a soldier who's been in war and you now have uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, right? So you have PTSD and um, nobody would blame a soldier back from the war for overreact, overreacting to fireworks, right? Like clearly they've been through it and something happens, uh, happened to them. And Hopefully they can get some sort of treatment that can lessen the severity of their symptoms. Um, but this is what Claudia we're saying. Claudia Miller actually recently reached out to our organization because she realizes that mycotoxins are a factor in tilt. Yeah. And she did, but did describe- In terms of her. like PTSD, um, I think a lot of times that people are so sick from mycotoxin exposure that when they have a reaction, the reaction maybe is from a part of their brain that makes them exhibit it like it's a stress response, but I don't think it's actually a trauma response. I think that this is like an actual response that's just not well understood. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, let me be clear, like this is an analogy that I'm using to explain to people like you know, like people who have these reactions, a a lot of times are gaslit and told, uh, well, like, this isn't normal. Like you're overreacting to something. And like, I don't see any biomarkers, you know, like doctors like, well, there's no biomarkers. So like, I don't know, maybe I should refer you to a psychiatrist and you can talk to them about it. And my analogy is to say like, 
look, you're not going to tell a soldier that what happened to them isn't real. And also you need to get the soldier off the battlefield so that they can start to heal. And I think a lot of people are still in the battlefield of being exposed to these things all the time. So we need to get people out of being exposed and then we can get them back to sort of quote unquote normal reactions to quote unquote normal exposure, which we all know aren't normal, but you know, like there's a whole range of human experience. But I think that, you know, it it's again, it's like not very well understood. We're at the beginning of being able to understand it. But the point is, is that there is now a biological explanation that can be handed to a doctor and say, look, I know this is fresh research, but like, this is a real thing that's happening. Here's why it's happening. And um, don't just refer me to a psychiatrist, right? Um, like take me as a whole person, as a person with a brain that is inside a body. And, you know, it might be inflammation, it might be all of these different things, but we're, we need to figure this out together instead of just telling me like, well, maybe go get therapy and like, um, and so you can like, you know, go get therapy and we're not going to make any accommodations or any changes to your outside world and your exposure. Who was Rachel Carson? Was she, um, just a, a, just a person that was just very involved in, in this situation? Cause it, it's just so weird because even in what the sixties, you know, researchers and doctors are not sounding the alarm on environmental issues. It had to be a, an advocate, a person passionate about this situation or personally okay. affected. This is something that we brought up before with, you know, the Aaron Brockovich and the Melinda Ballards of the situation. It's never these people that are supposed to protect the population that come up to say anything. Why do you think that's happening? Well, Rachel Carson, um, she's really interesting because she actually worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and so she was, her job was just to look at the the research that different um, scientists were doing and sort of type up reports and put them out there, right? And she was starting to get these reports from the scientists who were like, so we looked at what happened when they sprayed DDT over a, um, over a park, uh, you know, to get rid of mosquitoes and then all the fish died. And she was getting more and more alarmed about this. And she's also just, she was just a beautiful writer. Um, and so she, um, she had education in biology um, and um, she started writing for publications like the New Yorker. Um, and she brought this really lyrical um, quality to describing these problems, right? So it took somebody to translate the scientists and the researchers, which, you know, just the facts, very dry, a little bit impenetrable, and to paint a picture of not only, you know, the worst case scenario, if we don't stop doing this, this is what's going to happen. But the best case scenario, if we stop doing this, the birds will come back. And that's what's happened, right? Like there's bald eagle that there's bald eagles everywhere now. Um, so we need, uh, she was amazing at like, making this issue really come alive for people so that they cared. Do you think the EPA is doing their job now of protecting people since they've first started in what, when did they start in the eighties? Um, 1981, 83. Don't quote me on that. Um, no, no. I think they made a ton of progress in a decade or two and then progress just completely stalled out um they've ceded a lot of authority to states um so you are much safer in uh vermont or california than you are in louisiana or texas um and also the epa just covers domestic manufacturing right so they're looking at wastewater and emissions from factories that are in the US, they don't cover products. So for example, um, there was uh, on the American Airlines uniforms, one of the chemicals that came up when they tested it was chlordane. Chlordane is one of a handful of chemicals that the EPA has completely banned for all uses, but there's nothing illegal about putting it on a consumer product in another country and then importing that consumer product to the United States. Nothing illegal 
whatsoever. It's just sort of like, oh, that's unfortunate. Maybe the fashion brand should have thought about that. Um, so no, I don't think they're doing their job. I think they've done a lot in the past and they need to be reformed so that they can protect us today. Um, I think the Consumer Product Safety Commission also needs more funding and more authority to protect us as well. Um, I think there could just be a lot more done. And what is crazy to me is I didn't realize this. Asbestos is not actually legal in the United States to use. It's it, the only reason it's not everywhere is because there's a very clear con connection between exposure to asbestos and mesothelioma. And so people can sue companies and get payouts, but it's not actually banned. The EPA tried to ban it and then they got raked over the coals by the industry. And so they like walked back from that and they haven't banned anything for all uses in the United States um, since the 1980s. So we are very far behind. One of the uh, clusters that Claudia Miller based Tilt on was EPA headquarters in Washington, D.C. had a yeah. sick building syndrome incident. So that yeah. goes to show. Yeah, it goes to show. I mean, yeah, I don't think that EPA uh, employees have any say over, you know, what carpet is being specified for their building, unfortunately. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty ironic. And again, like the EPA doesn't cover stuff that's manufactured abroad. So if, I mean, it's possible that the carpet was sourced domestically, um, because it's a government building. Right. But, um, even then, like there are certain chemicals that, um, are just being phased out now, like perfluorinated chemicals, PFAS, um, and, um, <laughs> There's a lot of places in the United States, especially related to carpet making um, that have poisoned the local environment with perfluorinated chemicals. And um, the cleanup is just starting to begin. What a wild, <laughs> wild world we live in. Um, I just <laughs> wanted to report this because I literally just got an email from Claudia Miller like mm. seconds ago. Amazing. She says that she's coming out with a paper showing mold as the number one most frequently reported initiator for tilt. Nice. This is coming yeah. out in her paper and it's under. Awesome. That must be very affirming for you. Yeah. You know, I, I was trying when I was, I, I, when I've been working on this article and I'll send it to you when it goes live, I think it'll go live in the next couple of weeks um, about spray foam use in the United States. And I was trying to um, track incidences of mold exposure or mold problems, either by state or nationally. And I was very surprised to find that nobody's actually tracking it um, over time to see if it's going up or going down. We All should do that. That's such <laughs> a good idea. So there have been, um, I mean, I think this is like, definitely like, I'm hoping some researchers is gonna, um, uh, hear this or, or a government agency, right? Like the health agencies of states should be tracking mold exposure incidences to see if they're going up or going down. The best thing I could, the best stat I could find was an estimated 47% of households have some sort of moisture, old or mold issue. That is staggering, absolutely staggering. But back um, in the 1980s, when uh, I saw people reacting to clothes, reacting to buildings, I looked for a common denominator. And uh, no matter what chemical or substance people pointed at, that's what kept cropping up. And some people would point at formaldehyde and some people would point at uh, the carpet chemicals and sometimes even lead or radon. Yeah. And yet it, I kept hearing it over and over again. We renovated a house and that's when I got sick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's really, it's expensive to, I'm going through this right now. We bought an old farmhouse. We're trying to renovate it. We're trying to weatherize it. And um, it's really expensive to do it well. And the government will give you all the rebates and all of the, you know, if you're low income, they'll help you pay like, um, help you pay for weatherization and all of these things, um, which I, you know, is great, right? Like we need to say, like, especially if you're heating with oil right now, like you, we want to save money and we want to make our homes more comfortable, 
but they will not give you money for um, for addressing any moisture issues before you do that weatherization. And that is a problem. Building science experts say that you need to address moisture issues before you start wrapping your house, um, before you start putting plastic everywhere. Um, you need to address wet basements. You need to um, you need to make sure you have a fan in every bathroom for moisture. You should probably have a hood in your kitchen. There's all these things that you should do before you weatherize your house. And those things are expensive. They're difficult to do. You need a good contractor. You're going to tear everything up to do it well. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, hopefully someday in the future, the government will recognize that and support people in that process as well as weatherization. Yeah, um, thank you for that. I'm just, it, it's just, I always go back to the Silent Spring thing because it's like she was able to get people so riled up over this and start a movement and trying to do the same with the mold issue because it's growing yeah. exponentially and everyone you see has a mold problem. I mean, Michaela Peters yeah. came out, Tori Spelling just came out with a mold issue. It's like, we need that. We need the, the rally, the support of, of a lot more people to basically bring awareness to this and say that we need help here because it's, it's getting out of hand. And so yeah, I don't absolutely. know what happened to the population from the 1970s to now, but you know, people were so concerned about the birds and the bees then. No one was really concerned about each other now. <laughs> it's like, how do we rile their support? And yeah, bored with this issue because there's so many people being affected. Even those who don't think they are being affected are actually being affected. Yeah, and you know, I look the the book is ostensibly about fashion. It's how I found my way into this topic. And it's how I hope to pull more women into reading about this topic. But it ended up being about so much more, right? Fashion was just my way in. And, you know, even if you don't care one whit about fashion, I think anybody who suffers from chronic health issues um, or mold exposure will find a chapter in there that will speak to them and that perhaps they can hand to their family and friends and say, look, I know you love your Yankee candles, you know, I know you love your Glade plug-in, but this is a real issue for me. And maybe you could read this and understand why and, and have a little bit of empathy for my situation. I have a question about the uh, toxic uniforms. It seems yeah. like the logical thing to do was to have other people wear them and find out if they had the same effect on everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think the Harvard study that looked at Alaska uniform uh, attendance before and after. I mean, it was a it was a really solid natural experiment, right? Because they all got them at the same time. They would wear them for up to 24 hours um, inside a plane, right? Um, they're all, you know, they're all wearing the same uniforms. Like there's just not a lot of different variables. Um, and, you know, up to 25% of that population reported symptoms. Um, ended up reporting symptoms. And that's probably not even everybody who reported symptoms. And, you know, not everybody is susceptible to this, right? Like there's a genetic component um, or just like a, a personal history component, right? Um, you know, I, I told you that I don't personally suffer, suffer from chemical intolerance. Um, and it could be genetic, it could be good genetics. It could be that I am privileged to be able to grow up um, in, some neighborhoods um, that are pretty close to nature. And my mom, you know, my mom actually does not like scented products and, you know, doesn't over sanitize everything. So I feel like um, I'm really lucky in that way. But, you know, I, I think it for the history of toxic fashion, people have been saying, oh, well, not everybody reacts to this. So it's just an individual sensitivity or you're just too sensitive. You know, we saw that with the CEO of Carter's that, that made children's um, products and their, their tags were causing really bad rashes. And it was just like, oh, well, like there's some babies who are a little bit too sensitive, but by and large, it's okay. And so I wanna make sure that we don't fall into this trap of saying, well, it, you know, it's only a small portion of people who react small portion of people who react. So it's not a big deal. No, those people deserve care. 
And if we don't fix the problem for them, like it's gonna spread, right? Like it's gonna keep getting worse for everybody. And these these are the canaries in the coal mine. I mean, mm. to overuse a uh, to overuse a phrase, but you know, this is this is showing that this is a problem and we need to address it, even if it's not affecting everybody. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Alden. Uh, any last questions from Eric or Keeley? Well, it was a pleasure having you on. Your book is awesome. Um, you know, I don't think anybody's really talking about this in the forefront right now. I think there was, you know, maybe a documentary in the past, but no one's really talking about the implications of fashion and how that could be causing issues for the population. So thank you for writing this book and going beyond that topic, as you said, you're really going beyond the topic of, you know, people becoming hypersensitive and it's not just these people, it could happen to you. And absolutely. Oh, basically. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This has been such a great conversation. I'm uh, honored to be included in this conversation and, um, and yeah, good luck. Like keep fighting the good fight. I think you, know, what I do hope is that this book does start a movement. Um, and so maybe you can help us get there. Absolutely. If anyone wanted to, um, depending on when we air this pre-order or buy your book, where can they do so? Any place you buy books, um, it's on Amazon, Thrift Books. Um, there's an audio book that I recorded myself coming out as well. Um, uh, Barnes and Noble, Target. Um, and I will also say that I worked with the publisher um, to make sure that the book itself um, is amenable to people who have might have chemical intolerance. So it is a natural paper cover. It was completely manufactured and printed in the United States. So I can't guarantee it won't cause problems, but I was very specific in advocating for uh, a non-synthetic uh, book that people can hold in their hands uh, with confidence. Awesome. Hopefully the paper doesn't come from one of those bad paper mills. <laughs> <laughs> There's like fungus emergencies and paper mills worldwide that's ruining like napkins and paper products and all kinds oh, of stuff. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Well, yeah. So people could try it or of course there's the audio book version or the Kindle version. So um, yeah. lots of different choices for everybody. Feel free to just send me the link that you want in the show notes and we'll plug that in and okay, get people great. excited and buying your book. Thanks again, my dear. You have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you. So nice to meet everybody. Bye. <sighs> well, at least I didn't yell at her stop the recording mm. you're funny <laughs> got it on recording <laughs>